Thank you for coming tonight and experiencing this mural through the artist's eyes. Um, tonight, Danceville Artworks Mural Committee, along with the Danceville Area Historical Society, presents to you Clara Barton Mural, Artist Talk, by Melissa Stratton Pandina and her associate, Gabriela Sapovata. You got it. Yeah <laughs> I've been practicing. <laughs> okay. Um, this video tonight has been donated through the support of the Danceville Area Historical Society by life member David Smith. Nancy Helfrich, treasurer, newsletter editor of the Danceville Area Historical Society, we appreciate your help in organizing this videotaping. Thank you so much. Okay, so at this time, we would like to welcome the creative, wonderful muralist, Melissa Stratton Pandina, and her assistant, Gabriella. We would like to start by thanking Danceville for being so, so lovely to us and being so welcoming. We have learned so much by being here, and um, we have really enjoyed getting to meet all y'all. Um, we'd like to thank Julie and the rest of the mural committee. Um, honestly, we couldn't have had a better experience. So a little bit about myself. Um, I was brought up in the military. Um, I'm an army brat and I was born in Germany and I was raised in Germany. My dad happens to be a medic. So we happen to talk a lot about Claire Barden um, because it was important to what he did in his job. So she happened to be part of our dinner, dinner time conversation a fair bit. Um, one of the best things about growing up in Germany is I got to look at some of the best um, public art that happened to be there. So I happened to be in Berlin three days before the wall fell. Um, and I remember that mural having gone up not that far, not that long ago before we were there. Um, so I remember looking at these giant murals and um, that's in Bavaria. They have children's books murals all over their houses. And I wanted to do that when I grew up. This is some of my earlier work. I um, spent about 15, 20 years developing my skills as a, as a portrait artist. And I love doing um, public art. And in the beginning of my career, it was mostly doing the fiberglass um, art pieces, which I really enjoy. And this, these colors are so off. Um, so my first big piece, and Gabby was on oh, this one too. I'll help you with that one. Hi. <laughs> so I met Melissa in this piece, but we didn't we didn't exactly match meet, <laughs> meet in this piece. We met in another piece, but during this piece. Uh, we had gone through a similar program, but I had done it earlier. Uh, it was called the Community Mural Institute, and they have a muralism program where they teach the good space method, which is a muralism, an indirect muralism technique, where you paint the murals in panels elsewhere. You can paint them in your studio. And they are still community murals because you take out the panels into the community and they can help you paint them. So I had gone through this the year before Melissa was going through this. And I was invited to Fitchburg to help install this mural while she was painting it. Which there's a lot of text. So it was a really bad mural to put up. It was going sideways. It was going <laughs> in all directions. Um, this is the mural that we got together on. Um, Gabby was leading this one, and um, I needed a portrait artist because I am not. I am a scientific illustrator. So <laughs> give me plants and give me animals any day. But I had told the group, I need a portrait artist, please give me one. And they gave me Melissa. So this is 
We trauma bonded over this mural. <laughs> <laughs> it may be hot on this mural. This mural, it was 108 degrees. Wow. wow. It was, we were suffering together <laughs> and it was fun. And we've been doing murals together since. since. Where is that mural? That um, one is in Springfield. Springfield. So that one is in a school called Herena. And it is, there is a tunnel. If you can see, there is a tunnel right here. It goes so, under the highway. Mm -hmm. And it's an open tunnel. So regular, regular people would cross the school to, to get through this. But, in, but they also have to see this entire mural. It was 2,000 square feet, 3,000 feet? Yeah. Around 3,000 square feet long. Um, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> How long did it take to paint that? A month? That one took about a month. Really? Yep, and that one was also a community mural where it was direct on the wall. So the same thing that we did here where we did the paint on the paint by numbers on the wall, we had done it in this mural as well. And these are just some other projects that we've done. Um, this was the abolitionist walk in um, Greenfield. Um, we've done, I mean, both of those were community murals. That one just happens to be at our dentist's office. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's an aquarium, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the Southwick Zoo. Okay, so how we start our murals. We start our murals with sketches. So um, in the same way that when you're starting to write a story, you just write notes and you don't judge. We just make scribbles. <laughs> so what I'm looking for when I'm making my scribbles is how the elements that we want in there look in the design. So when we first started, um, the thing, we do a lot of research, obviously, um, and the angel of the battlefield came, came up and up and up and up. So we wanted to put wings on there. However, we could not figure out a way that it did not look so like something from an eighth grade bedroom. <laughs> and that's where the quilt came in. Um, on that one, we were able to take the circle from the quilt and make kind of wings with it. Like you have to squint a lot, like kind of close your eyes. Um, <laughs> use your imagination. <laughs> but it's where the idea came from. Um, so once we do that, so on our research, because we are always working on projects, so um, YouTube is really a good one because I don't really have enough time to read a lot of books. And books are really granular, and they take a lot of time. So I watch a lot of TV shows. Uh, so The Gilded Age had a whole season based on Clara Barton, which was really wonderful. I'm sure it's not accurate. Um, <laughs> we watched Junkin Histories, and we watched a lot of um, PBS documentaries to get a really good grasp of what Clara Barton did. Once we have those ideas, and we've done through the sketchbook thing, um, what I did is I grabbed my daughter, and I put her in a corset, and made her pose. And then we were able to take the, um, the actual portraits of Claire Barton with her costumes and start to Photoshop and manipulate the actual clothing onto a living model. And that's how we get a dynamic figure. So this is, this is what the, um, the sketch looks like in the end. We do it all in the computer. That way, when we are told no, which happens, um, it's pretty easy to switch things around. Um, and it also makes a really accurate sketch. One of the worst things in murals is if you have any errors, they end up on the wall. We end up doing a lot of free drawing anyway because nothing ever goes as planned. But um, you got to think on your feet. You got to think on your feet. But um, this gives us the best chance of having as little oopsies as we possibly can. The next thing we do in this is we do um, studies. I don't have any pictures of my studies here, but I do paint small, the, the elements that really matter. So we painted Sarah Barden's face a few times. Um, we painted the house a couple times. So 
We got up at like five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Jumped in a car and came down. Um, and that gave us time to pick up the paints and really get situated and wait for the sun to go down. Um, this was lovely. The mural committee helped us the entire time. Um, we thought we could use a um, camera tripod. We were wrong. So we set up the bakers, which is, if you've been around, if you see the yellow like table thing that's really high, that's a baker's scaffold. So we put the projector onto the baker's scaffold, borrowed the um, electricity from across the street, and um, started projecting. Um, our first night, we ended at one o'clock. We started at 8.39. We ended around one o'clock. And then we started painting the next day. And then we, we did another night the, um, the night afterwards to do the other half of the building. So when you say you do that, what do you do that first night? What are you actually doing on the wall? We're drawing. <laughs> we're projecting the mural. So we're drawing the line work, the base line work that is going to go. So every single outline, everything, if you, if you see the photos of Clara Barton, the before ones, you can see some sections that are painted and some sections that are just outlines and squiggles throughout the wall. We were doing the outlines and the squiggles that day. And we follow those outlines when we are painting. And one of the challenging parts of doing historical photographs is they typically are pretty washed out. So like on Clara, her nose went away. So um, it gets us about the proportions and then we just look at the photograph and try to get as, as close to the photograph as we can when we're, when we're actually up there. Did you have some of the challenges with Clara since she was, what was she, was she 80 when, or 60 when she came here? She, was, we, she wasn't a young woman. She was 54. 54, thank you. We used, one of, we used a younger photograph of her and um, so we used that photograph of her but it's washed out and she has no nostrils. <laughs> that was the biggest problem with this photograph. And especially when it's blown up, as big as we blow it up. The quality gets worse. It becomes potato. <laughs> then we had our paint party. So we took the first five feet. I see a lot of the same faces that we saw on that night. Um, and we, if, if you weren't here, we turned it into a giant color by number. And Dansville broke one of our records. Before Dansville, our youngest participant had been um, two years old. In Dansville, that little guy painted. <laughs> and he did a great job. Um, so, so we had all ages. And um, the, for the people we counted, it was 161 people who came. Um, and that. So that's our base. We know at least 161 people showed up to come paint with us. And it was on the rain day. So um, y'all did an amazing job. So we've just been painting. <laughs> our, our days start around 7 or 8. Um, and we are here until normally about 9 or 10 when the sun goes down. Um, we've, luck we've been very lucky um, that we've only had one rain day which we got to go see Letchworth, so that was kind of worth it. Um, and um, we've just been painting. And painting. And, and painting. painting. And more painting. And baking in the sun. Uh, there is a harness. There is a harness. <laughs> we, you can see it right there. Yeah. So these, were, these lovely photos were gifted to us um, by a professional photographer who, sh who stopped by. Um, that's what we have for you. Do you, you guys have any questions? John Spaulding. John Spaulding. I was close. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> how about the initial process? Like, how did you know Dansel wanted this done? What, what, what went into, how were you selected? I don't know any of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you all did the horse, it became, my, my in-laws live up on the hill. It was like, oh, Dansville has a good art program. I have to watch them. So um, about a year ago, um, the mural committee put out this really wonderful, well-written um, RF, RFP. So um, 
requesting, requesting for projects. They said they wanted a portrait of Claire Barton, they wanted the house, and they wanted the quote. Everything else was our sandbox to play with. Um, so we submitted our package, and what we do when we submit a package is we submit, I submitted two sketches, two digital sketches, one with a dynamic figure and one with her sitting down, which for them to choose from. Um, we show past work, um, and we write a big giant essay about please pick me, please pick me, please pick me. <laughs> um, so we put our package together, and Dansville's a really small town, so um, my in-laws are talking to me about like, ooh, we're, we're hearing that people are interested in your work. <laughs> <laughs> Who are your in-laws? Um, Alice and um, Frank Pandina, they live up on the hill. Um, so we were one of two finalists that were picked. Um, Dansville gave us a couple edits that they wanted done. It's a much better painting, thanks to their edits. Um, Which doesn't happen often. Usually no. when they give you edits, you start getting frustrated and you're like, why are you ruining my work? This one, it was definitely, oh, that's a much better idea. <laughs> um, so we, we, gave, we submitted the edits and we got picked. Um, and that's, and that's, that's how the process goes. So when you're in your colors, how, uh, I mean, there's gonna be colors that are mixed or what? How do you? Well, there's, there's two different things in, that, in the color thing. First of all, when we were picking colors initially in the sketch, we were going off of a complementary palette. We wanted a lot of, um, we knew the quilt was gonna be blues, so we picked a lot of oranges inside the tents to make sure that everything was very um, dynamic in, the, in its color range. When we were picking the individual colors, I am really not a technology person. So I um, print out the picture as big as I can get it, and I sit there with um, one of those big color flip-through books, trying mm -hmm. to match up as much as I can. Um, I happen to have some computer files that I know different colors that work really well for us. So if it's at all close to those colors, those are the ones that I pick. Um, otherwise, I'm there with my book. Melissa has also worked with color palettes that she has used previously before in other portraits, so she knows that these colors look well on this skin tone and these colors look well on this skin tone. Your paints, do you bring that with you? Do you order online? These were, um, the mural committee helped us get, um, get a really good price at Sherman Williams. So all the paints come from Geneseo um, Sherman Williams. Um, it just makes it so much easier to like get the paints in the place besides the fact that murals are expensive and the more money that can go back into the general um, area, the better it is. Well, that's typically what you do. Yes. You try to go local. Yes. The area. <clears throat> do you use preservatives over it or how do you keep it from fading? These are really good paints. There is a pretty big um, debate in, in the mural community about whether or not to use um, a top coat. The problem with a top coat is one, it's really expensive. Um, it's not good for us, like healthy for us. Also, it yellows and it makes the paint um, more fragile. So uh, with paints, with such a lovely town where, um, we, we, it's not really a lot of graffiti in the in the town. It, there, so we don't really have to top coat it. So we're not in this project. Okay, share. How long does a mural last? Good question. Um, a mural should last between ten and fifteen years. It, it depends on the weather. It depends on the weather. I de <laughs> it depends on what's it. It depends on what's underneath it. Um, Which fortunately, this wall was beautifully power washed before we did it. And uh, after about 10, 15 years, sometimes you'll get some patches that are. Then it just gets restored. So if the town really loves it, then we come back and we fix it, 
and then we you can continue fixing it. Um, I I've seen murals last twenty to thirty years if they're being restored on a on a on a regular basis. Otherwise, if the town doesn't really love it, you have new spots for new work. <laughs> <laughs> Girls look very nice dressed up. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't used to seeing you. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Picture. Um, how many murals do you paint in a year? In a year. It depends on the year. <laughs> and it depends on the size and it depends on how you count them. Normally I think about about fifteen. Wow. Yeah. Oh. So some of those are small. <laughs> some of those are small. And if they're large scale, five. around five or six, it can be depending on the on the project. If we did if we did fifteen of these walls, we'd die. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. do that. I'd say. I'm wondering having kids that live in Brooklyn, where there's not a wall that isn't not by Banksy, just trash yeah. graffiti. How do, how do we, I mean, it seems like Dansville's in a big graffiti plate, but attractive nuisances are, you know, sometimes out of the way. How do you suggest we protect it besides having, like, posses of people? How do you? So in Springfield, graffiti is actually a huge thing, but what happens with the community muralism is that since everybody takes a part, there is kind of this unwritten rule with graffiti artists about like respecting the art, but because it belongs to everybody, usually the people that are graphers are also involved in the project and they don't want to tag it themselves. So the community part has helped as an anti-graffiti. Um, and with, and this is specifically with graffiti artists. I don't know about young hooligans, um, <laughs> but there is kind of an unwritten rule of respecting each other's art and not bombing each other's pieces. And that also goes with mural painting. And we could look at the Mustang too. The Mustang has not been tagged and it's two years old, so. How many gallons of <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> this one will take, a, we're going to have little bits of, this one will be about 15 to 20 gallons of paint. <laughs> Sometimes we cut the paint too, like when, when we're painting, and if it's hot and your paint is drying really fast. Sorry, I was using I was using my Puerto Rican voice. Um, so on a day like today where it's really hot, uh, I'll take a, little, a bottle of water and just pour a little bit in the paint, and it'll last a little bit longer. Um, and not do that too much. You don't want to cut the paint so it's watering down. And um, but when it's drying so quickly, <laughs> sometimes it's a necessary evil. For this mural, we also have used. Um, 29 colors so we have a fair bit of colors and then we mix between the different colors to get an even bigger range so you mentioned the angel wings in reference to the quilt is there any other significance to that quilt no I, I use quilts a lot in in, in backgrounds because I really like them um, and then we found out that half of y'all quilt. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that was a happy coincidence. <laughs> so we were really, really psyched about that. The other reason why we used the quilt is because we wanted that cross for the red cross. And it made so much sense to put that into the context of a quilt. It looked really pretty. Um, so those were our reasons. We've had a couple different... Um, other interpretations of of importance of the quilt, and it's all right. <laughs> what age did you start painting What age? Ooh, good question. I did my first mural when I was 17, 16, 17? About 18. Okay. Well, 
But that's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> Has there been anything, uh, what, I guess, what really cool things have you learned about Clara Barton doing your research? Anything that really stands out to you guys? One of the things that we did not put in the thing is that she got shot, she got shot through the dress on her first um, AIDS um, aid drop. It's through drunken history, so it might not be right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can you can <laughs> fix it. <laughs> <laughs> but that was one of the neatest things. Um, we've also learned a lot about the water cures that were here, um, and it's. So being from Puerto Rico, I knew nothing about Clara Barton. So this has been a very educational experience for me. Everything has been just like wonderful. And now I'm kind of obsessed and want to keep But we do have Red Cross in Puerto Rico. Yes, we do have Red Cross in Puerto Rico. Do you have another wall that you are going to attack at some point in time? I have a suggestion if you do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Hey, talk to the committee. Right, right over there. We're, everybody wearing committee. Yeah. Committee shirts. Um, yep. We were so fortunate. Um, Live Coast spur speared us with um, the Mustang, and we got a lot of information. We went around to the building owners, looked at buildings that were possibilities in town. Out of 11 building owners, nine said, yes, we want a mural. So from that point, we made a rubric and we asked them what their commitment would be as far as you know, fixing your building, you know, filling in the windows, the ledges where paint was chipped, fixed, and how much you know you were willing to do that. After they sent the survey back, we also gave them a list of 12 different themes. Um, I did some research with um, Jane Scriver and what's important to Dansville, you know, the history of Dansville. So they chose what they would like on their building. Then the rubrics is made, each of the committee members, um, let's see, we have Salome, Lori, Jennifer, Susan, um, Sonny, myself, um, Donna. Donna, Donna, and Mike Nagel, um, he was our village rep, uh, we filled out rubrics about accessibility, vis visualness, um, and we did it all on our own. Then we came together, rated it, talked about it, and here we are. Long story short, we have a few walls that are ready to go, um, but then there's the money thing, and we'll talk about the money later. <laughs> yes, this doesn't come for free. <laughs> Jerry has a question yeah. here. Whoops, sorry. That's okay. Go ahead. Oh. Are you working on a future project right now? Because you, you mentioned something about doing sketches. Are you doing a sketch right now on some future projects? We are. Right now we are doing... Um, she's about to go off to Minnesota. So I am doing um, a third Nelson Stevens mural in Springfield... Uh, in August and then at the end of September I'll be going to Minnesota to put a mural up on a school in Rochester <laughs> and, Rochester, Minnesota. Yes. <laughs> and we're working on a sign together and we have two mural we have a sign and another mural going up in the zoo um, in in a cup probably by the fall um, the the sign will be like needs to be done by tomorrow and um, the huh? <laughs> and the um, the other mural we're waiting for the building to be finished and then we'll start on that one. This is a PT related question. Do you have trouble with tendonitis or neck irritations or any of that kind of stuff on all your PT? I was a massage therapist for 15 years, so I know how badly I'm hurting myself. <laughs> um, we do a little bit. So we do a lot of like um, stretches. Um, we go see a, um, a massage therapist um, as soon as we get home. Um, and we try to keep up with like the exercises. Because it's, it's one of those things where your, your longevity in this career is really put up. And um, I really don't want to tear my um, 
rotator cuff because that one is not a great surgery. That one hurts. <laughs> That is a wonderful question. Her, her question was, if you want to become, become a mural, mural artist, artist, where do you start? First, draw. Constantly draw. Don't stop drawing. That is the key to everything. It helps if you go to college for art. I would recommend going to a art school and not a university that teaches art because you want to be around, surrounded by the best of the best. And it is a hard, hard major to be in. Um, and then don't take no for, for anything. You have to believe in yourself. And you have to be relentless. And you have to be relentless. And you get used to drawing big. So I used to have a teacher who was, um, he was actually from Poland, and he went through the um, a Soviet system um, art education, which I very much appreciate how he taught us. I am so glad that I did not have his experience. Um, and he used to say, the bigger you draw, the more you know. So start small, and then get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's also really easy to try at a smaller scale. So. There's a lot in public art. So murals can be chalk. I love sidewalk chalk. Um, oh, we do sidewalk chalk a competitions lot. a lot. And so even when you're outside playing with chalk, draw a big picture with it. That's the beginning of learning to mural. Draw everywhere and constantly. Does that help? And you could do whatever you want to put your mind to. Because it's, it, you'll do it. <laughs> my mom did let me paint my bedroom wall, but I don't know how much that's gonna fly. <laughs> Any other questions? What uh, art school did you go to, and what would you get? I went to Mass Art. Um, I studied illustration. Um, when I went in, I started in 1999. We had we they let in 10% of the people who applied, and they graduated 20%. Um, and they put you through the ringer. I love Mass Art because it is the only state-run art school in the entire country, and Massachusetts spends the same amount on Mass Art as it does on Mass Naval Academy. <laughs> a, um, because we're a weird state. But um, <laughs> I'm very much appreciative of my school. And I went, <clears throat> I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, and I did my master's at Atlantic University College in Puerto Rico. Um, so I majored in painting and drawing when I did my bachelor's, and then I ma uh, majored in graphic design when I did my master's. This, this one. one. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "What is our what is the what is our favorite mural that we ever painted?" Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. The interview you gave to the Livingston County News, you commented that every muralist looks for their Everest, and that was. You know, as, as a person who's been thinking about this for years, that was an incredible statement to hear. So do you really consider this year, to date at least, your Everest? Yes. <laughs> um, this isn't quite my biggest one. My biggest one is at the zoo for the carousel. Okay. Um, but that one was a bunch of smaller murals that were all put together. There was um, 12 murals in that project all together. And it was indoors. Um, and it was very controlled. Um, and I got to be at a zoo by myself at nighttime, which is really fun. But this one, we are outside in the elements. Um, and it is, it's really big. Um, so yeah, this has definitely been one of the one of the more challenging murals we've had and it's been amazing. Thank you.
Which zoo? Um, Southwick Zoo in Menden, Mass. Do you take the winters off, I hope? Or do you go south? <laughs> winters are for winters are for ourselves. Yeah. So sometimes I take illustration jobs during this during the winters, but for the most part, um, I do a lot of showing in museums, in um, different art magazines, and different art competitions. So all and I teach. I teach painting. So my winters are filled with teaching and making my own art that I'm going to put into competitions later. Um, and so that's, I, I, yeah, that that's winter for me. Winter for me is like making sure my skills are as sharp as I possibly can have them. In my winters, I, minus the teaching, <laughs> uh, it depends. Sometimes I go back home and I visit my family in Puerto Rico because I managed to get some time off. Uh, but for the most part, I will take smaller illustration jobs that are in my house, in my cozy home. <laughs> um, they're not as painful, but that helps ride out the winter until the next spring and mural season. Or I may work on a mural on polytab, which is an indoor indirect technique, so I can work in a studio space in the winter. So, and then install it later on in the spring. But then I'm grumpy because they are cutting into my time. <laughs> but then that happens. Yes. Several of us noticed that Claire Barton's I think, right hand is resting on the molding. Did you plan it that way or? Yes, I am, I love, okay, so most of the historical figures, she has her hand very daintily on desks. <laughs> um, and it just happened to, I really believe in like dynamic figures. I love dynamic figures. And having her hand resting in a place that makes the space, make it look like it really fits into the space was really fun for me. So yeah, that was totally purposeful. And we, when we were doing the projection, we had to change a couple of things to make sure that that stayed perfect. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was definitely purposeful. I love the lighting of the tents. Just yeah. looks so oh, thank cozy. You. Thank you. Like, you know, they're, they're not in good shape inside those tents, but <laughs> <laughs> it looks warm and mm. good. We love doing the lighting of those tents. And one of the most important things for to medicine at that time point, please correct me when I'm wrong, um, was light. So one of the stories that we heard was that when um, she brought supplies, she'd taken all the bandages and all the things that she thought was really important, but the most important things to the medical staff was that she brought lanterns and that the lanterns saved a lot more lives than all the sterile supplies in the world. Going back to design and stuff, man hour standpoint. So from the time that committees gave you a go, how many man hours did you have to spend between that day and the day you walked in here to start? I think it's about 60 to 80 uh, man hours for the design and the studies. Um, and the, th okay, it's probably closer to 100 by the time we pick out the paint. Um, so probably about, about 100 just for the prep work. Because um, we also have to like prep all the things for, for projecting. We have to cut, and especially for this wall, where I wasn't a hundred percent on the size, we cut up that mural about five different ways, in in case our numbers were wrong, because the last thing we want to do is like get here and go, oh shoot, our our projection is completely wrong and we can't get it to go, and then I'm on my on the phone with my husband trying to get. Now you need to make the this thing this size, and that. That would not go well. So you never got the measurements of the building? I no, no, we no, did. No, no, they no, did. no, 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 we do. We did. It, it's, we don't, and. It's never an exact process. It's, it's never exact. <laughs> There's always something that's going to be wrong, either in our, our understanding of the measurements, or um, you very rarely get the, um, the, the um, architectural blueprints, which are the most accurate. Buildings shift and they change over time. Something, nothing, I've never been on a mural 
And between the two of us, we've done about a hundred. Um, that's gone right. <laughs> there's always something that's wrong. This one was close, but there was there's just about this much that was wrong. Um, so it, the the numbers were really accurate. They just weren't perfect, and that has nothing to do with how they measured or anything else. It's just it, sometimes between the tr the change in translation changes. It actually resulted, though, with some components of the mural being even stronger than they were planned to be. So for us, it was a happy situation. We were so happy with those mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the best part about the tents? Because when the sun sets, the tents glow yeah. and not completely intended of course <laughs> there is a specific time in sunset that if you look at the mural the sun glows exactly where the cross is oh. and what there time is just is that? like one Video? spot huh uh, what time is that because we're, the sun is going yeah. to be <laughs> it's around it's <laughs> right when it's about to go down yeah down. yeah like around 8 30 45 or something and it's just like one yeah. orange spot on on the quote Using that lighting, the tent lighting as an example, so did you know exactly what color paint you're going to use, or do you got adjustments when you paint, or how does that all go about in your process? It's like anything else. Um, so what my dad taught me, plan, 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 plan. When you're doing it, scratch the plan and keep going. Um, so we, we had a plan. We had we were mostly right on the plan on how the tents would go. Um, there was a couple adjustments that we had to make, um, but we had an idea of what the colors would look together. So, you know, you just don't get so married to your plan that you make mistakes. Muralism is a very men plan, God laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> Do you want to write to this mural? I, I would love, you know, to have print or whatever that in my house. How does that work? You are the artist, you did all the hard work. You know, obviously I can try to take a picture with my camera or whatever, but do you own the rights to it? Or is that too hard a question? That's a complicated question because there's grants involved. Um, we can't, I don't believe we can profit from it. We own the rights, but the town also owns the rights um, because they're allowed to do basically whatever they want with it. Um, it's just complicated. And I'm not 100% sure on the answer on this particular wall. Why did you become a mural artist? Why did you become a mural artist? When I got out of school, I really still loved to paint. And I painted all the time. But I painted in my parents' basement. And my mom was like, you can't be an artist in the basement. <laughs> so this is about as far away from the basement as I possibly can get. <laughs> so whenever I feel discouraged, because being an artist, you get discouraged a fair bit. I just remember that I'm not in the basement, and I make really big artwork that's totally couldn't fit in my basement. <laughs> Oh, my answer is not as good as yours. <laughs> I, I fought tooth and nail becoming a mural artist. I really did. But every single path directed me towards muralism. My first teacher was a muralist. So I was painting large scale at a young age. Who my, studied with? So my first teacher was a student of one of Diego Rivera's apprentice. And um, to those of you that don't know, Diego Rivera was Frida Kahlo's husband, uh, a very prominent muralist in Mexico. Who had a hobby of painting. <laughs> who, who had a hobby of painting, <laughs> who dabbled in muralism. <laughs> but uh, so he was the one who taught me how to paint when I was 12. And I was grabbing five, six foot panels when I was 12 and I was painting, but I kept saying I didn't want to be a muralist. <laughs> 
And but I kept falling into the hands of muralists. Like then I fell into the hands of Greta McLean, who also taught me her muralism technique. And and that's all she wrote. Now I'm a muralist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any permeability to the paints that you are using? I, I know that from a building preservation standpoint, brick that is painted doesn't get to breathe as much and tends to spall over time, deteriorate. So is, is there any permeability to help the building stay with a real good surface? I'm not 100% sure on that one. Um... The reason why we use latex is because it moves with the building. Um, so I, I would guess to a point, I know more with the poly tab that it does help preserve the bricks, but I'm, and that has the painting with a bunch of different other layers. So I th think it does help a little bit, but but you just never know. Answer that a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Cynthia Haupt from the Landmark Society when she came down and helped our Main Street. Some buildings are meant to be painted and they have to be painted. And like my buildings, you don't paint it. But the really soft bricks had to be painted. A lot of our bricks were made right around here. But the ones that are baked through their kiln stronger don't need to be. So she said, so there's some that you should never paint. And some you should always paint, and it depends on That's the really good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I learned a lot from Cynthia. She's pretty wonderful. Good. This is a history um, related question. Was the Castle of the Hill originally um, mental? Was, like, was the Castle of the Hill originally a hospital in the 1800s? <laughs> well, first of all, the uh, the water cure, the uh, facility up there, was the reason that Clara Barton came to Dansville back in 1876. Um, by that time, she was already famous. She, um, you know, through her exploits during the Civil War, helping the uh, <clears throat> helping the soldiers taking supplies out to the battlefield, and then after the war. Uh, helping to locate um, missing soldiers. Uh, and she went, she went on nationwide uh, lecture tours, including one in Dansville before she came here to live. Uh, <clears throat> then she went to Europe and learned about this organization called the Red Cross. And that became her new uh, cause. And she was very much desirous of the United States having their version. Uh, Clara Barton's problem, though, was that she tended to push herself beyond her limits. And after about a couple of years um, after her return from Europe, and she was still mostly a, uh, a bedridden invalid, um, she came to Dansville to partake of the water cure in the facility that was known as Our Home on the Hillside. She came here and she lived here for 10 years, 1876 to 1886. And uh, those, in my opinion, were the most crucial years of her life because even though she was famous by that point, um, again, through her uh, Civil War adventures, her biggest project was yet to come, the American Red Cross. And it was by coming to Dansville and getting her health back and getting a uh, circle of friends in town to support her, she was able to uh, rekindle her uh, crusade to form an American Red Cross, which took, and that, that crusade came to fruition in 1881. And uh, almost immediately, they had a, a disaster relief project, a forest fire in Michigan. Um, if you find yourself driving up the east coast of the uh, lower peninsula of Michigan, um, an area known as the Thumb, you know what the lower half of Michigan looks like, a big mitten, uh, at some point you'll find a highway marker. And the highway marker says about the Great Thumb Fire of 1881, this was the first disaster to which the Red Cross supplied relief. And that happened just a few weeks after she formed the first chapter here in Dansville. So it wasn't a very big organization yet, but they got their toe in the water. 
And so for the next five years, Clara Barton would go back and forth between Dansville and uh, Washington, D.C. to help bolster the American Red Cross. She eventually left Dansville in 1886 when basically she became too busy to live here anymore. And so that's why uh, Dansville can celebrate its, uh, its role in helping Clara Barton form the Red Cross. Yes. And she maintained, she made really good friends here. She maintained close relationships with some of the people who she had met here, uh, particularly Dr. Harriet Newell Austin. They maintained a correspondence until Harriet died in 1891. And if you go on to the Library of Congress website into the Clara Barton files, you can find letters from and to Harriet and Clara on the library that's publicly available. Uh, Clara called her Harry, my dear Harry, for Harriet. Harriet. Yeah, it was Harriet Newell, like a Newell post, only with two L's, and then Austin. Harriet Newell Austin. Austin Street up on Health Street was named after her. Harriet no, no, right. To add to what David said, yes, it's been the Castle on the Hill has basically been a health institution of some sorts for most of its life. But during World War II, to answer the question, or World War One, to answer the question, was it ever specifically a hospital per se? Yes, the United States uh, government took it over and turned it into a military hospital, uh, which a lot of the interior damage took place because of the the way they didn't take care of it. And uh, that information can be found on the web, uh, website also. Uh, this was hospital number 13 here, and then it changed to number 19. And you can trace a whole history of what it did, where it did, and when eventually where it moved to. Then in the 20s, when there was not much of anything going on at the hospital, or at uh, the Castle on the Hill at all, uh, there was a period that it was uh, the Genesee Valley Hospital. Uh, we have pictures of the front of the castle with signs on it that prove that. And uh, I backed that up with search, uh, title searches at the uh, county courthouse because I was surprised, what is this? <laughs> uh, very surprised to find that. So, uh, yes, it was a hospital and it was a nurse training hospital for a while. And then it went out of business and then uh, Bernard McFadden took it over in the late 20s. It was always some kind of health facility, whether it was a hospital or whether it was a, a spa or a health <coughs> resort. People came to Dansville to get better, and that's why Clara Barton came here. Thank you so much. We appreciate all the insight. Everybody has quite a variety of insight. That makes this project all the, mo all the more rich. Uh, but thank you to Melissa Brooks Mural Committee has the intent to continue this process of placing murals in our downtown. Uh, you can be part of that financially if you're interested. There's a piece of paper over there that explains how you would contribute. And we would be grateful. Artworks is a 501c3. Thank you again. Thank Wonderful you again. job. And thank you for coming. Watch the progress. Melissa, will you be coming back for the dedication? Yes. Yes, wonderful. So these lovely ladies, when they leave, hopefully later this week, not pushing you out, but I know you have other things to do, clearly. Um, but they will be back for the dedication on August 10th. So thank you. Thank you.